Hi there, this is James Chai, RFR Park Bark, Bark Rescue Foundation, and uh, the guy that trains extremely dangerous and predatorial dogs. I am starting on my October 3rd broadcast, and uh, this one is, I think, number 9. I think I just mislabeled the number there. Um, anyhow, I hope everybody's doing really well, and I decided to start a little bit earlier today, around uh, 6.24, um, because it's a uh, Pacific Standard Time. I'm here on the West Coast and I know that there are a few people who are in different countries and uh, on the East Coast that are uh, trying to stay awake to watch my um, to watch my broadcast and be able to respond back to me when things happen. I'm trying to figure out the right timeline so if you all have a, an idea of what you want to see uh, like at what time let me know and we'll go from there. Uh, the other thing is I am doing this uh, to help spread awareness on how to um, work with dogs without medication and treats to address dogs on their psychological uh, root basis uh, far beyond anything that academia and science has done so and uh, so please please share my posts uh, please subscribe to my YouTube channel uh, last night a few people did uh, do so to my YouTube channel and thank you so much uh, there's no ads there's no ads on my website there's not gonna be any ads as long as I can uh, do that and hopefully you know a couple years from now I'll, I'll still be ad free uh, all of this, all of this is self-funded, so I want to definitely be able to do all that and uh, continue to spread what I'm doing uh, to be able to um, show everybody that what I'm doing uh, with the predatorial giants that I can do that. Uh, thank you, Larry, for uh, thank you, Lori, for sharing in uh, peace, love, Danes. Um, yeah. So what I want to do is I want to be able to um, uh, share what I'm doing, working with predatorial giants throughout every aspect of uh, uh, dysfunction, every psychological issue, no matter how extreme these dogs are, I've been able to successfully work them uh, and down train them. Um, same with like, for example, yesterday I mentioned about Miki the Jindo from Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation in Los Angeles who have rescued over 20,000 dogs from the meat dog farms in Asia, from uh, stray and abuse cases locally within the United States as well as in Mexico and so forth like that and I've been able to work dog that nobody else can. It's not because I'm magical, it's not because I'm great or anything like that, it's because I'm paying attention to what the dog's nuanced behaviors are and I have been teaching people how to do this themselves. My free um, training help, if you go to my website arfarfbarkbark.com and click on the tab uh, help for your dogs, you'll be able to again see the stuff that I've done for people. I've written, uh, I've read their descriptions and looked at their photos and been able to give uh, quite profoundly uh, in-depth psychological evaluations and everybody says how do you know this how do you know this how do you know what my dog's like this is something that you can do yourselves so it's not as if it's anything magical or, or, or just don't overthink things simplify trust your intuition your intuition comes to you from a million years of evolution so again just keep learning how I'm doing this and listen to the way I perceive and, and interpret a dog's behavior on the psychological level. Please share my post so that way we can change the world uh, for dogs. There are six million dogs killed annually in North America in shelters and owner-directed killings primarily for behavioral issues and um, that's horrible. And you would say, okay, six million dogs, is that realistic, etc.? There are almost a hundred million dogs in North America, according to the pet industry statistics in 2018. It is a seven zero seventy billion dollar industry. Seventy two percent of the people that take care of the dogs in a household are female. So, you know, there's a reason why women are taking care of dogs because intuitively and uh, emotionally, they uh, women understand dogs better than men. Men are so much more brute force. Um, you know. It's just that part of understanding that, and so um, if we can just change the world. So, oh shoot, I forgot to turn the sound off, guys. I'm sorry. Um, if we can change the world for dogs, uh, it's going to have to start from the people who have the biggest hearts uh, to to do. And again, if you're owning a dog that has some behavioral issues, it's really important. Uh, one of the things I want to bring up is a, an excellent topic that uh, was brought up by Amy Reynoshek. Uh, founder of Save Rocky, the Great Dane Rescue and Rehab Charity. I'll put her link in, in my description after I've gone through all this. Um, Save Rocky is the largest Great Dane Rescue in North America. They have between 80 to 110 Great Danes in their rescue at any given time. Uh, so you can imagine the substantial cost of running a rescue and they are a charity. 
uh, they can issue tax receipts so please um, give them some support and uh, you know and if you can't give them support please help share their polls if you can't do that please help share other rescues polls so that dogs can be saved and we can kind of change things as well uh, once again please try to share my posts uh, subscribe to my channel it all helps because the more that my word can get out there to teach people the more people will understand that they can do this themselves won't cost them anything to be able to figure out how to work out with their own dogs and down train them and address behavioral issues uh, so what Amy brought up was regards to shelters and the mislabeling of dogs that are either fear reactive or aggressive and I'm using these generalized terms as I said the other day is I'm not a big fan of um, uh, you know of, of generalized labels because we want to be more specific when we describe a dog psychology so the same thing when we talk about a human being and if somebody you know I'll just use a guy right we'll say, so you know we talk about a guy who, who's uh, you know angry we don't go and say well he's fear reactive he's aggressive we talk about him in a bit more detail we're like uh, you know he's aggressive because I think because his family life wasn't that great and he had this and this and this happened to him and when he was a kid he got his, his mom passed away those things all contribute to the way human beings psychologically develop same thing with dogs dogs process at one tenth of a second the triggers which means that all the aspects of their emotional and logical processing is happening at one tenth of a second and as I love saying, you know, Chris Rock once said that tiger is going to be a tiger. So the dog is going to be a dog. The dog is going to react. The dog is going to process things throughout. Um, and when they're in the shelter, it's a really difficult environment to be in. You've got cement walls along the sides above. Dogs have such sensitive hearing. Can you imagine how that feels to a dog? To not just hear it, but to just feel that constant stress and anxiety at all times. It's, it's like someone sticking your head in a garbage can, a steel garbage can, and just smashing the side of it with a spoon and banging it and banging it and doing that for 12 hours a day. And then you finally fall asleep out of exhaustion and then they start banging it again. Once one dog barks, the other dog barks, the barking reverberates throughout the entire, it, it echoes throughout the entire shelter. With such sensitivity these dogs have, we're subjecting dogs to extreme torture by the sound what they should be doing is soundproofing the walls by putting you know egg cartons uh, those, those foam egg cartons to absorb sound uh, a, a lot of things that should happen but unfortunately uh, politically speaking at this point in time we don't have the will uh, to have that move forward in the recognition of sentience for dogs when a dog is in the shelter subject to these things you'll see a lot of times where the dog is just, just shut down people will always say you know what uh, it was just a shelter the dog is normal and then the shelter will have no choice but to put a label on their dog's behavior because to them they're running through so many dogs in a day you know there are shelters in Texas that are killing a hundred thousand dogs a year each that's pretty brutal so a hundred thousand dogs that's that's a, over eight thousand dogs a month being killed that's 200 plus 300 plus dogs a day being killed on average the numbers sound phenomenally unbelievable but it's happening 199.4 million 100 million dogs in 2018 six percent of them are being killed which is a really low number if you think about six percent but it is six million dogs that are being killed the dogs are ending up in the shelter because owners are not paying attention to their dogs behavior the owners families are not addressing issues that they think are cute to begin with and then they let the dog just go wild because they're not paying attention when the dog starts being reactive then they start blaming the dog instead of taking responsibility same thing if your kid starts running around and starts screaming and pulling things off the toy shelf at the toy store you're going to be responsible for what's happening with your dog I mean with your, your child as you will be with your dog the uh, the labeling of a dog as being aggressive in a shelter the reality is the dog this these innocent dogs are not just under stress and anxiety they're alone their dogs are uh, dogs are overt codependent they need to be with other dogs they need to be with other people they need to be able to socialize and they're being left in these shelters and they are just being destroyed mentally and then those dogs that are a bit more cognitive in regards to processing their environment or emotionally uh, uh, um, uh, cognitive they start processing what's going on and to them it causes the fear issue on their end 
because they have to protect themselves. I read this uh, uh, in another group, uh, a local group here. I read a trainer, um, uh, uh, you know, her initials are SB, and she said some of the most ridiculously silly, inane things uh, in regards to that, saying, you know, dogs fear humans. It's like, dogs don't fear humans. Dogs cohabitate with humans for 10,000 plus years, lady. What are you talking about? And what ends up happening is because there's uh, uh, a trainer gets to a point where they're just so stuck in their way and their reputation is so high up that they just start missing everything about life and they start labeling things incorrectly. Then those trainers go into the shelter because they have a reputation and the shelter believes what the trainer says. Oh, you know, the dog is fearful. The dog is fearful. The dog is reactive because he's fearful. The dog is completely fearful, of course. If we were thrown in jail... It would be incredibly upsetting. It's it's a it would be a, a absolute horrible thing to be in a jail. If you've gone to a shelter, just to sit inside a shelter with a dog that's reactive, you start to learn. Yeah, I know why this dog's reactive. I would go crazy too. Like the sound is driving me nuts. The shelter system needs to understand that they they need to respect the fact that they have to address the sound issue. They're having dogs laying on concrete as well. I mean. If we laid on concrete, we're going to be in significant pain. Concrete sucks out heat, all those aspects of it. I understand the fact that, again, you know, dogs pee and poo in their shell, uh, in their in their kennel. But we've got to find a way to, to be able to soften that ground, be able to uh, even out the sound. But again, aggression is generally out of fear because a lot of times when these dogs are removed from the shelter, they become pretty happy dogs. They become safe for feeling. They understand that their environment is safe. When you get a dog from a shelter, you're adopting a dog, try to just work with that dog. And, and, and you know, somebody else, uh, I saw an article, I read an article about, you know, leave the dog alone for a few days, right? Leave the dog alone when you get him home and so forth like that and, and let them, you know, it, it's, it's silly. Because then what ends up happening is if you leave the dog alone when you get home and you just let them do whatever they want, most dogs will be okay with that. The dysfunctional dogs won't be. They don't understand what's going on. They just find, okay, well, I'm in a different environment. It's kind of like the shelter. I don't have any companionship, etc. Who is this human being? How do I address my relationship with this human being in this home? How am I supposed to react? I, I don't know what they're like. And then when people start sort of trying to move around and react with the dog and, and interact with the dog, that dog is like, okay, that's weird because for the last four days you were ignoring me and now you're trying to approach me. And with a dysfunctional dog, that will cause them to become defensive. And then they will start to be reactive. So again, I always encourage people when you do get your dog, uh, adopting your dog is to work with them when you bring them in. Within safety reasons, of course, but to work with them in the sense of associating, spending time with them and letting them understand that your relationship with them is, um, is beautiful that you're not out there to hurt them and uh, you're trying to make them feel at home and interact with them. Use your dog's name. If they have an existing name or they have a new name, use their name. Always use their name. So your dog learns who they are in your home and they learn that the sound of your voice saying with their name allows them to feel a bit more calmer. Um, the other thing too is, is when a dog is being killed for behavior. Uh, and I, I just mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, you know, I'm in a, in a reactive dog group and someone posted uh, in that reactive dog group, when is it that a dog bites you? When does it come to the point that you will say enough is enough and kill that dog? Surprisingly, well, not surprisingly, uh, I would say probably 40, 50%, 60% of those respondents that commented on that post all said kill, 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 kill that dog. These are trainers. These are behaviorists in this group of, 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 of over between ten and 20,000 members. There's this percentage of about 60%. They're all saying kill the... Like, what is wrong with these people? It's because they've followed this industry, the dog training industry, the, the psychology, the academia, for all this time from, from 1897, from Pavlov, treat training and all that stuff. They followed this incredibly... Uh, silly envelope that's super duper narrow thinking that treats are going to help a dog in actual fact um you know i haven't heard back from that behaviorist that i mentioned yesterday who was in the huffington post so you know maybe i'll mention her again tomorrow and see if she's going to respond or not but the reality is 
When you're killing a dog for behavior, the responsibility is on us, the human being. Because why, we, why would someone say that we're going to kill this dog? Oh, because I can't train the dog, because the dog's reactive. Because the dog is being a dog, as Chris Rock said. Tiger's being a tiger. So the dog is being just a dog. The dog is being defensive. The dog doesn't know what's going on. And we're pushing the boundaries of that dog's personal space, expecting that this dog should be just like every other dog in the world that just is happy and friendly. You know how many posts that I that I see where people are like, oh, my dog is this, my dog is that, and it's the dog, there's no name. The post is one, maybe two paragraphs, two short paragraphs, talking about the dog's behavior, which is just really lightly touched. There's nothing much to it. And then people are just like, oh, oh, the dog should be this, dog should be that. But nobody says, well, what was the dog's issues beforehand? What was the dog's behavior beforehand? Nobody ever says... The dog's not unpredictable. They're all saying, well, you know, the dog's reactive. You can't predict what's going to happen to the dog, so that's too dangerous. But the dog is predictable if these trainers and behaviors are paying attention. And I'm not talking about the ones that are just, you know, you know, at a certain level because we all have our own skill sets. I'm talking about the ones that are at the top level, the ones that have the reputation. People like Dr. Ian Dunbar who comes up with that ridiculously rhetorical bite level skill, which uh, somebody talked to me about that today, uh, who I'm, I'm going to see their dog tomorrow. And um, the behavior of the dog is something that is super important to recognize because if the vet is prescribing medication to the to your dog, right? So I'm just going to say it's my dog because it just sounds silly. So if you go to the if I go to the vet with my behaviorally challenged dog and I say my dog is reactive to other dogs, what do I do? The vet is always going to say, well, here, let me prescribe you some some medication for your dog, Prozac, whatever. Let's prescribe some medication. So what is a vet prescribing it for? The behavior of the dog. What is the behavior of the dog? It's a dysfunction. What is the dysfunction? The dysfunction is psychological. So do you see like the the reverse? banality of this like it's banal the fact that they're addressing psychology of a dog with human with human medication and then they're saying well if the dog doesn't respond to this the dog should be killed they're not realizing the fact that if we're pres if the vet is prescribing medication to a dog for psychological issues then perhaps let's put away the medication for a bit and try to figure out the psychological issue first before we start brute forcing it with medication, before we start brute forcing it with prong collars, before we start brute forcing it with shock collars and, and, and other uh, primitive aspects of, uh, of control from a trainer's perspective. And, and, and that again is those trainers at the top of the food chain. You know, there are trainers out there. I, I know of one trainer who charges $30,000 to go out to, to see somebody uh, in North America. And this is a well-known trainer with a, with a TV show. And it's like, is that is that what you're in it for? Thirty grand to go see one dog in North America? You're gonna charge this couple, this family, thirty thousand dollars? You're gonna fly to Florida? They might be affluent people, but you're gonna charge them thirty thousand dollars? And what are you gonna do? The behavior of our dogs, especially ones that are in our home that we've had for a number of uh, 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 like a length of years, if not many many months the behavior of those dogs have always been existent. It has never been a, a surprise. Their, their personality is always there. Just like they say with human beings, you can tell a person's personality by the way they are and the way they talk and the way they treat, etc. They can't change, etc. The dog is the same aspect in that same route that this dog is behaviorally challenged. It's psychologically rooted in dysfunction. We have to figure out the dysfunction of the dog. We have to figure out if the dog is suffering from insecurity, low self-esteem, low self-confidence. You know, another silly thing that I read as well, and again, going back to this behavioral aspect of it, is, is Temple Grandin says in her uh, one of her interviews, uh, it's so silly. It's like listening. It's like reading a, a kid's crayon drawing about why the sky is blue, as I always say. And she writes ridiculously that dogs don't know how to act safe in a dangerous situation and I'm like dogs don't know how to act safe in a dangerous like what is wrong with her and I get that she's autistic and she freely speaks about being autistic but it's like 
dogs can indeed act safe in a dangerous situation. It's how we allow our dogs to feel safe by our behavior and by our instructions and whether or not the dog trusts us. There's lots of times where I have reactive dogs and that I've walked them and then I get them calmed down and I've down trained them and they're stable and they're out there in public and all that stuff and then there's somebody with a reactive dog themselves and my dog that is with me who has now learned to trust me not try to attack that dog and kill that dog because they're because of the, my dog's significant size they'll be afraid because they're coming to me saying well you, you got to take care of me because you've always proven that you can take care of me and so how do we make that dog feel safe so if there's a dog right here I'm sorry I'm going to do the, the framework here <laughs> uh, if there's a dog here and, and my dog is here he won't walk through unless I let him know that I'm safe I, that the environment is safe that I'm going to take care of him so the aggressive dog, rah, 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 I can get my dog to walk by. And I can tell my dog is scared that this dog is going to attack him. Even if he's been extremely reactive before in the past, I can get my dog to walk past the aggressive dog because my dog trusts me. And when, that dog walk, when, when my dog walks past that aggressive dog, he's acting safe. Because if he wasn't acting safe my dog would start immediately attacking the other dog. And when you're talking about a Great Dane with a 5 to 700 PSI bite strength, the other dog will lose if the Great Dane gets a hold of that other dog. So to say that a dog can't act safe just shows you the banality, the simplicity, the, uh, the immaturity of uh, Temple Grandin's uh, uh, work. Um, it's just, just absolutely ridiculous. And... When you have somebody who's just speaking superficially without the depth of understanding, who has never had experience with extremely dangerous dogs, I don't care if she's one of the top 100 people uh, by Time Magazine, you're getting this kind of information that's wrong. And those type of people are the ones who pronounce dogs that are reactive, aggressive, dangerous, to be killed. Dr. Ian Dunbar, he's got the bite level scale that says, you know, bite level four. I talked about it the other day. Bite level six is the bite where it kills either a human being or a dog but it's a rhetorical scale his scale only applies after the dog has attacked if the dog's bitten you and, and caused lacerations then it's a bite level five dog so a two-year-old child could say the same thing oh yeah that dog bit the person and they're bleeding and that dog is dangerous oh thank you two-year-old child have you met dr ian dunbar it's the blind leading the blind. These are the people who are leading the academia. These are the people who are leading the APDT and all these other affiliations without re recognizing that they're already limited and instead they're living on their laurels. They're living on their egos and, and they're sacrificing dogs' behavior to be killed. And that's what happens in the shelter system. Well, you know what? If he, th this dog does what Dr. Ian Dunbar's issue is, regardless of the psychological issue of this dog, the dog gets killed. If the dog doesn't respond to treats, and that's what Lima is, that's what operant conditioning is by uh, uh, B.F. Skinner. All these things, and B.F. Skinner's been debunked besides that, just really ridiculous behavior on, on some of these academics. But what ends up happening is when you're at the top of the food chain, the last thing you want is to be knocked off of that, especially by somebody like me who's uneducated, but who has 100% success across the board. It's embarrassing for these scientists. It's, it's embarrassing for these academics. I even sent Temple Grandin a, a, a post uh, uh, four months ago. She read it and then she deleted it. The top protect themselves at the expense of six million dogs killed annually. If they were having a different focus and saying, you know what, this dog is reactive and dangerous, but we can work with this dog by helping them psychologically there would be a big change. But instead it's, well, this dog that's dangerous won't take the treats. And if the dog doesn't take the treats, then the dog is broken. The dog can't be fixed. And as I've said before, nowhere in the entire canine species itself does food exist as a communication device. It doesn't exist as a reward fiat. You will never see another dog picking up a piece of food to give it to another dog for, for, for doing a good job. But instead, as human beings, we brute force that because we're apex predators. We're at the top of the food chain. So we say that dog's broken because that dog ain't taking no treats.
because that dog is too dangerous because we don't understand what's going on with that dog because it won't take a treat, so that dog needs to be killed. I hope one day it can be disproven publicly to the point that it will cause the industry to shift what they're doing so that the dog training industry will realize the simplicity of the work that I'm talking about has always existed within their hands. Like I talked about the intermediate bridging and it turns out it's not intermediate bridging. It's just your intuition. You're finally trusting, but it's so entrenched by the people at the top saying, this is the way or the highway. So all these dogs in the shelters, all these dogs that the trainers are getting that don't know what to do with them, trying the same methods over again and it's not working. Hey, you know what? Let's kill the dog. Um, okay, so I want to talk about a, a topic that's somewhat unique here is, uh, is dogs following your finger when you point to something. And they say that in a lot of articles that I've looked online here um, that dogs are able to learn where we're pointing our finger to. So if, we, if I point over to the, to the wall, the dog is going to learn to, uh, the dog knows to look over at where I'm pointing. This is again another piece of human arrogance. This is again another piece of conjecture that's been anthropomorphized by humans. By saying, well yeah, the dog learned how to point. The dog learned where I was pointing. Yeah, the dog knows automatically how, how, where, where I'm pointing, which is totally ridiculous. The dogs that I get in, extremely limited socialization, they don't know what pointing means. They just, they look past the finger and they look at me like, well, what's he pointing? Dogs that come in from, from the, the wild, stray dogs, abandoned dogs, uh, wild dogs, generationally speaking, that have lived in the wild, you bring them into a domestic situation, a domesticated home, these dogs don't know anything about pointing either. So then, James, you're just saying, well, then why is it that dogs are following my finger when I point them, point, point somewhere to them? We don't even realize that we've been doing these sublimo training techniques this entire time. I've dropped things on the ground. It's fallen down, you know, like a piece of food. It's fallen down on the ground. And, and as my dog's waiting to get a treat from my finger, you know, something's fallen on the ground. They haven't seen it. And they're just waiting. And they're like, okay, where's the food? Where's the food? And if I point downward, they still look at me like, where's the food? Where's the food? And then I start bringing my finger down and I have to shake my hand a little bit so they start following the, they start to track it and I bring it down to the ground. And the dog says like, well, what's, what do you, what's on the ground? I don't recognize it. And then once I start telling the, uh, the dog to, to, here you go, here, 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 here it is, here it is. Here's a treat. Then the dog goes down, sniffs it, realizes it's food, eats it. And then the dog associates with our finger pointing to the ground because we've trained them without realizing we've trained them and then all of a sudden we see the dog following our finger pointing like oh my gosh a dog is amazing they're such smart animals they are smart animals because they learn to to follow us they learn to understand our signals through step by step by step training even trying to get a dog if, I, if i'm making stuff here in the kitchen uh, to give everybody food their dinners i'll tell them to go back when they start crowding the kitchen, I'll say, go back. And I'll point out back towards the kitchen, uh, outside the kitchen. And I'll say, go back, go back, go back, go back. Thank you, Odette. Um, and and so, so the dog will go back and go back. But he doesn't understand what I'm doing. Same thing like I said about dogs barking at the window. I will physically walk the dog back while pointing behind them, pointing back behind them. And I'll say, go back, go back, go back. And in the beginning, they have no idea what I'm talking about. And repetitively, over several days, sometimes weeks, they eventually learn. And I start to point, and then they start to learn that. But in the beginning, they have no idea what I'm pointing at, and I've had to train them over time. Same thing if I want them to get off my bed, because I'm trying to make the bed, and I try to point them down to the ground, off the bed. They have no idea what I'm talking about. They don't know what I'm pointing at. Typically, you would think, well, if I'm pointing to the ground, the dog on the bed is going to jump off the bed to go down to the ground to look for that treat or something there. But they don't put it together. And, and maybe because of the fact that I don't do treat training on a dysfunctional level. You know, it's, treat training is great for recall. Treat training is great for obedience, uh, uh, for search and rescue. Uh, uh, all these aspects of treat training is great for that compliance. It expedites compliance. But when it comes to dysfunctions, 
I'm not using treats. So I don't have the benefit of going, well, you know, you got to follow this treat. The dog learns my finger pointing. The dog learns that finger pointing from my gross efforts, G-R-O-S-S, -S, gross efforts of saying, go back. And I'm physically moving the dog back. And I'm pointing at the same time because I know eventually I don't have to push him back. I just have to point, go back or go out or leave. And then the dog picks it up over time. We've, we've trained the dog to do that over time through the finger pointing. So when you see somebody talking about dogs know how to finger point, you have to correct them and say, hey, you know what? It's actually not finger pointing. It's actually, we've trained the dog. And so when you think back about it with your own dogs and how you train them how to finger pointing, just remember the fact in the, in the beginning, those dogs didn't know what you were talking about. Your dog had no idea what you're pointing at, but we trained them over time. And then because of our arrogance, we think, oh, well, the dog's amazing. Because we haven't seen our own path of training, of instruction. And all those aspects of training instructions, when we're pointing to the ground and all that stuff, there's no treats at that time either when you guys are doing it yourselves. And you just developed it and developed it, but not paid attention to it. Uh, you know, and, and again, that goes back to responsibility and abdication of responsibility, etc. Uh, for, for that behavior. Um, okay, so let, let me see here. So I've, I've been on here for about like 15 minutes. Uh, does anybody want to ask any questions, anything like that at all? Uh, Adette says, I love to see you working with a reactive dog to learn from you. It's a shame that you're so many miles away. I've seen your video. Oh. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, all the stuff that that's out there, people can learn on their own. And um, it, it's really not that. You know, I mean, it seems a little bit tough, um, but yeah, there. And I and I just did up a post earlier today, um, uh, regards to Tonka, the Great Dane, uh, from uh, the Southampton Animal Shelter in New York, uh, and he's the one that's in the newspaper and all that stuff. And he's the one that uh, attacked 16 people in New York, dragged the shelter worker into his kennel, uh, inflicted significant wounds and all that stuff. And uh, I just want to say thank you to Patty Lucci. Who, uh, who's known online as L uh, Lloyd Allen. I mean, she tells everybody that's her, her you know, pseudonym. Um, and she had spent over a year with, uh, with Tonka. You know, she was the only one that could get close to him. She's the only one that could get into his kennel with him. Uh, and, and keep in mind, Tonka had grabbed another shelter worker who accidentally put her arm into his kennel at night to give him a, a peanut butter Kong. And she didn't realize that she should have turned the light on and so forth. And she admits it was her own fault. And she had stuck her arm in uh, to put in the uh, the, the Kong. And uh, uh, Tonka had grabbed her by the arm and dragged her into his kennel. And um, there's some quite horrific uh, uh, interactions. And she, of course, uh, needed 42 stitches to close up wounds, significant wounds on her arm. And I saw those pictures, right? So um, I have to say that Patty's done uh, some, some great work, Lloyd Allen, right? Uh, Patty's done some great work with, uh, with Tonka for the year. And uh, it's great that she recognized that Tonka was a victim. He'd been beaten by people who were not taking responsibility. Uh, he was beaten so badly by one owner, or quote-unquote owner, who, who beat him in the head so hard that he became 20% blind, 20% 10% uh, hearing impaired, and uh, some brain damage. Right, and right off the bat, 180 plus dog that is 38 inches at the withers, six over six feet four inches standing height, uh, being medically uh, uh, aggressive because of his hearing and his vision problem uh, is already way too much for most people. And then you couple in uh, into that the reactivity that he had because he went through seven homes and six of them all admitted to beating him. One owner shock collared him so badly to teach him not to resource guard, uh, so badly that Tonka was shivering, quivering, and drooling every time he got near his food bowl, which worked for that owner. And, and apparently when he returned, returned Tonka back to the shelter at Southampton's, he was laughing about it, saying, I trained this dog not to be resource guarding with a shock collar because he was quivering and drooling and shaking in fear. What this idiot didn't realize with the shock collar is that he made Tonka even more predatorial, even more extreme. He made predatorial behavior as an inherent process for Tonka. Tonka would guard anything and everything. And it wasn't just getting a couple of feet close. Even 10, 12 feet close when he was eating, he would react. 
some of the most in intensely scary aspects have occurred uh, with Tonka. And these are things that if I don't take into account when I get a dog, any dog, like Tonka again, when, if I don't take into account things like this, then I will be killed, right? I, I'd, be, I, I, I'd be really um, quite dead. Um, because uh, he, he's pretty, he was he was pretty significant when he came here. But the resource guarding all these things, right? So people are people are not realizing that if you're you're shock collaring and shocking a dog that already has reactivity issues, that has sight vision issues, um, that has uh, 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 trust issues with human beings, and then you start brute forcing them and, and shock call shocking them, especially with food, you're gonna make them even worse. And it may not be to you at that time because the dog is afraid of you, right? So you fear, defensive, the dog is afraid of you. What ends up happening is because he went to the next home, he got even more reactive around his food and would attack people. And, you know, when I got him, he was just brutal. Tonka was absolutely brutal. I mean, as I said before, um, he got away from his uh, police handler, uh, from Patty, um, and cornered me in the hotel room in Seattle and, um, you know, grabbed me and attacked me and uh, ragdolled me a bit. It is like you see on TV in the wildlife movies. Um, it's pretty frightening and it's, it's, it's freaky because I'm 190 pounds and it was like nothing, like a twig. And, you know, <laughs> I'm yelling like, ow, 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 right? And, uh, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do. He's not going to let go. So finally they were able to pull him off of me and all that. And he was just, he was, he was way, way, way dangerous after that. And she had to try to muzzle him and she was able to get him muzzled. He ended up biting her through his, uh, his, his muzzle, getting several fingers and all that. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things where, uh, the behaviors of the human beings lead up to the next dog and what you do with the one dog when you have him and if you can't fix this dog and you surrender him back to the shelter or you surrender him back to rescue the stupid things that you do and I'm saying stupid things like trying to brute force a dog trying to alpha him and all that stuff that gets submerged into your dog that gets hidden in your dog it's like the child that gets beaten it gets submerged in their behavior and then it manifests out in the future when they're older. So this is what happens to the dog. And because the dog is defensive, because the dog is trying to protect themselves, their only aspect of defense is to be offensive, to attack, to do those things that will protect themselves from being attacked. So what you do with your dog that you can't handle, if you do the wrong things, if you do the brute force things, you create a dog that when you return them back to rescue, back to the shelter, you create a dog that's even worse. And then what happens is the next person gets attacked. Be mindful of the way we treat our dogs. Pay attention to what happens when you get your dog into the home for the first time. Give them that time to understand that you're not going to hurt them, that you're going to interact with them, that you are going to treat them really well. And again, I'm talking about dysfunctional dogs. I'm talking about the dogs that are predatorial, that are dangerous, that are extremely dangerous. Those type of dogs people don't bring in. But for those of you who do, create an interaction with them. Start talking to them. Start using their name while you're talking to them so they become acclimated to who you are, your voice, your tone of voice. Use a full voice. Don't talk high pitch and or whispery or whatever. You want your dog to understand that you're talking in a regular tone of voice so that way they understand that there's an even keel there's a reliability in your tone of voice they don't have to worry about you being disingenuous being like ah and, and just just silly stuff anyways um so uh, i just want to say thank you to 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 patty and i want to say uh, or aka lloyd and and her wife um sue tiska uh, for uh, giving me the trust to be able to uh, take Tonka. I know you guys had phoned around in the Southampton Animal Shelter. I phoned around all over North America for four months, like just, you know, just repeatedly phoning this behaviors and this trainer and this master dog trainer and this well-known person and that well-known person in training. And everybody was saying, no way we're not going to take Tonka. He's too dangerous. He's going to kill me or them or one of their staff. 
And, uh, you know, yeah, I took the risk and all that, and I already knew he was going to be no issue, um, relatively speaking. But, you know, again, Lloyd, uh, thank you so much for uh, taking that time to trust me and to uh, know that I could do it. And I have posted up on my page as well um, the, the, the incredibly kind words that you said about me um, in your post uh, about, um, about, uh, about Tonka. You know, so I hope everything's going well for you and all that. Um, and, um, you know, I look forward to... Uh, um, uh, you know, you having a good life and all that stuff and what you did for Tonka was pretty cool. Um, okay, so are there any questions? Is there anything else that anybody wants to talk about? Um, I might just end this uh, just because kind of running out of things here. Um, okay. Let me just see here. Actually, I have somebody else who sent me um, a message. Yeah, no, okay, we'll, we'll deal with that some other time here. All right, uh, all right, so uh, have a great Thursday. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, sorry to kind of delay that little bit, last few seconds and all that stuff. If you have any questions, let me know. If you have any comments, please comment below. Please share my posts. Uh, please help people learn to understand that there is a modern, cooler way to train dogs, and that aspect is to really connect to your dog. Uh, actually, you know, I'll just take a couple more minutes, right? But um, just talk to your dog talk to them in regular conversational tone uh, like i said don't be disingenuous don't use fake so sounds of voice talk to them as if you would be talking to your friend family member child talk to them in a regular tone of voice watch their behavior watch your dog's behavior when you're talking to them because they're going to look at you like why are you talking to me like people and then you start to understand that you're respecting them because the tone that we talk to our dogs and the tone that we talk to our human friends and, 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 and uh, family it has to be the same. And then your dog picks it up and your dog understands that they're part of that family, uh, that your family and all that. And that's the same thing when you're getting a new dog in, from the shelter when you're adopting a rescue is that they can learn how to understand that they're inclusive because you're using regular tone, regular voice of language uh, with everybody. Uh, okay, so thank you so much again. And uh, tomorrow I'll, I'll try to get some a uh, bit more topics. I have... Uh, you know some sessions tomorrow and I will try to try to maybe do something a little bit earlier in the afternoon as well I want to say hi to my little nephew out in Toronto or Montreal uh, uh, to Eric and uh, I hope everything's good say hi to your dad for me um, and I will talk to you all later bye bye